uh, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, it will get. It's it's just such a crazy time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I came to work because I just crossed the street and I don't see anyone. <laughs> I I I'm, I love my office, so so it's not. Uh, you know, there's no one around and. And I'm wearing a mask, and you know it's very empty here. Mm -hmm. Some inpatients, but they're in the back, so mm. so we don't we don't have contact with anyone. Everybody's home now. All research. Yeah, home. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're yeah. waiting for permission to open the lab and to restart human experiments because we can do only so much. Yeah. Uh, at home. Uh, at Without home, it. yes, yeah. and so and we are we're already prepared, probably enough setups and enough protocols to run the lab for another year at least and mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of crazy mm -hmm. but yeah yeah, um, um. yeah it, it is kind of crazy <laughs> yeah so we we're having actually we really love the lab meetings in zoom <laughs> So we're getting used to now. So mm -hmm. it's not a bad idea. I think we're going to continue that for a while. Yeah. Yeah. We also have lab meetings on Zoom. Yeah. But uh, a couple of days ago, for the first time, we actually met in the lab with a few people. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. So we, we are allowed in. We, uh, we are supposed to wear masks, which we do in the hallways. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Uh, Overall, it's 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 not too bad. It's it, it's empty, so it's probably the safest place. Yes. Is my yes. office? Yes, indeed. Uh -huh. yes. Yeah, yeah, it's the same here. Yeah, and the inpatients are very protected, and, and they have been testing. They're doing testing in our hospital, mm -hmm. so uh, so they have been all tested. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Richard, oh, Richard. Richard, we got the speaker. That's that's good news. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, speaker? You seem to be <laughs> visible. Sometimes, sometimes the views on Zoom are not too flattering. <laughs> Richard, can you hear us? No, I don't think he's hearing yeah, us yet. Yeah, it doesn't look so. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh huh. No, he decided it would be fair if he doesn't hear us that we cannot see him. <laughs> no, Bob, yes. Bob is also coming. <clears throat> Bob is coming and they don't turn on their cameras. <laughs> uh, they are it's hiding. Because of, they... It's because of how, how, it, how beautiful we look on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, okay. Bob, I love you oriented that way. Better? You look so much better, and you're <laughs> muted, okay. by the way. Bob, when Bob, you're yeah, muted, Bob. you also are even better. <laughs> yeah, we can't hear you, and we can see you sideways. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not All right. All right. <laughs> Richard, can you hear us? And please unmute yourselves uh, until further notice. I think I'm unmuted. This is the first time I've used my cell phone for Zoom. Oh, okay. All right. That's why I'm messing up. Oh, that's why you turn so easily. You sideways yeah. again. Yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, I feel sideways. How are you feeling, Anatole? You doing well? Talking to you. Uh, I'm okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. How are you? Good. Yeah. I, I never thought that gravity is so different in different parts of State College. <laughs> that's crazy here. Yes. Yeah, that's a big anomaly. I think I could do this. Is that better? Yes, exactly. Yes, you can. <laughs> Your phone doesn't flip by itself? How come it's you're saying that way? I don't know. It's the first time I've used the Zoom app on the phone. Maybe you don't have your phone uh, to flipping. Allowing it to so, uh, what about Richard? I think we lost the speaker, which oh, is not a good, good thing. Uh, not a good sign. I have a card of credit. Okay. 
Men jag, jag tänker att det är så. Ta av kroppen. Jag ska ta av kroppen. Vi är getting mind. Richard och vi är getting someone anonymous. Just a black square. Okay. Luis. We are all already online. Oh, uh, Gregor. Oh. Hey, hey. Okay. Unmute yourself, Gregor. I, if you want I, hi, Gregor. Hi. We are, we are already, already online. online. On YouTube, on YouTube and, and Facebook. Uh, what about Richard? We cannot see him and it looks like he cannot hear us. Yeah, yeah. looks that, looks that he, has, he has... Well, well I think that, I think the, that the way that, that, that he has... has his login has, has no, no voice. voice. I think that, I think he, that should he should try, try to, log, to out log out and log in again. Nay, where are you? Nay. Please, Anderson wants to you know, open your uh, camera so we can see you. <coughs> After all, we're working with you every day. Okay. okay. Richard, I think, I think that you should, that you log, should out log out and try, and try to, to log in again. Because, because you, you even have, have the option to unmute yourself. Well, I'm, I'm writing him uh, in chat. Okay. Okay. I hope hope he reads it. I don't know. If I don't you know if you have any power, power Mark, Mark, to change, to change the, way the way he's the way of, the way of the his login, login in order to put voice, voice to him. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, no, it doesn't allow me to do anything. Well, unless I don't know how to handle it. Maybe you can mm. unmute or... I, I can't turn his camera on, though. No, it doesn't allow me to do anything. But you're the, uh, you're the host, so you should be able to, if you go up to the... the I went to participants and... Uh, it simply shows the status of the participants, but it doesn't show. Right. Go to and go to the on top left. There's a yeah, a green shield. Okay. There, there a green shield, and there you can. Yes. Change. They have settings there. That's right. Uh, so what I can do? I'm not sure. General. Can you unmute all participants or something? Uh, well, I'm trying to figure out audio. Mute microphone, press and hold space. No? Let me check if the audio is okay. It doesn't allow me. I can hide non-video participants. <coughs> that wouldn't help much, I guess. I suspect it's at Richard's end. He's probably um, his microphone might not have been recognized. Uh, when you log in, you have to yeah. allow uh, Zoom access to your microphone. CJ, hello. Can you guys who join? Can you turn on your cameras? Please. I will. Just a second, Mark. I'm running around doing a bit. Uh, okay. Uh, down the road, let's go. Mm -hmm. How uh, how my my postdoc was asking where the YouTube is. Did you send a link for that somewhere? Oh, I have, oh, I have sent an email. But if, but if you if you yeah. well, I will write. It's from you, Louis. Yes. Yes. All right. Maybe I didn't check that out. YouTube.com. YouTube. Okay. Thanks. That's good. Okay. Okay. So uh, it was from you. How can we... So Richard disappeared again. No, 
Luis, can you send me the link also, please? Yes, yes. I, I, I will send, I I send to all of you in the chat. In the chat, in the chat message. Yes. Oh, yes. chat message. Okay, great. Well, we haven't had 47 people watching. Such troubles during the earlier talks, but. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. I can see. Yeah. We are online. Oh, yeah. Okay. I can see that. Yeah. We are online. You'd have to turn off the audio on the YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Richard wrote me an email. My browser is not allowing me to use my microphone. I will try another one, then call in. What is the number? What kind of number? I'm not sure what it means. A number, a phone number associated with Zoom that allows you to call in for audio only. I don't know what it is. It should be on the initial Zoom link. Uh, uh, I have ID, I have invitation link, but I, uh, so, <clears throat> You get an email from Zoom, and, and that email has all that access information, usually. Uh, no, uh, it, it doesn't. It asks me to... Oh, Richard Van Emmerich is sitting in a wrong uh, Zoom. So, gosh, it's so complicated. I'm going to go close the radio, okay? Um, Mark, I, I have the phone number here. I can send it to... Uh, I can send it to Richard. If he's, if he's the speaker, okay, he's I speaker said, right? Uh, he's so speaking to uh, So he needs to share... He also will need to share a screen. I'm not sure that works through the dial-up. Uh, is getting complicated. And we have some long-term echo here, something strange. Yeah, long-term echo means that some people have YouTube on and their microphone on. Long -term echo. So if you want to have that, then mute the YouTube. Set volume on YouTube to zero. Then it will disappear. I thought some people have YouTube on. Huh? Yeah, Feldman. I'm sure that's you. Hey, Richard, try saying something. Yeah, YouTube something. YouTube. Yeah, there, you're good. Uh, wow, we got this. Uh, well, unfortunately, guys, I have to do a little. I've had some bad problems here, and um, my other computer was incompatible for some reason. I have to uh, copy a file over, but. Uh, all I'm right. Ready in about five minutes or less. No problem. All right. All right. Well, at least we're moving in the right direction. It seems. Okay, Richard. Hi, Richard. Yeah. All right. You can go ahead with your intro if you want. I'm just going to copy a file from this other machine, and I'll be ready to go. All right. So, uh, Luis, are we ready to go? Yes. Okay. 
Okay, so welcome everybody for the second uh, set of talks within this virtual Motor Control Summer School 2020. And uh, uh, it's great to have Richard Nichols, who is still copying his talk on the correct machine uh, to present it. Uh, Richard and most of the other presenters during this second uh, batch of talks uh, had plenty of experience presenting at real motor control summer schools. So they know the rules, they are not going to be surprised by interruptions, and maybe they will even welcome the interruptions. So uh, uh, it's probably too repetitive to say that I've known Richard for over 30 years, because it seems like I've known everybody by over 30 years. Uh, or, or at least close to that. But that's actually true. My very first long distance visit from Chicago was to Atlanta to visit Richard and uh, his lab and to present at Emory where he worked at that time, which was probably in 1988 or something like that. Uh, so I'm sure that uh, Richard will tell us a lot about Golgi tendon organs, 1B afferents, uh, reflex pathways in the spinal cord, and uh, will make sense out of them, and maybe even how they interact with CPGs. I'm not sure about that, but we'll, we'll see. So, uh, Richard, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, so, then I'm going to ask everybody to please mute yourself, those who are on Zoom, please you, mute your microphones. And Richard, if you want to ask a question and interrupt, of course, please do, but then unmute uh, yourself. So Richard, it's time to share your screen and begin. Okay, uh, let me say that I've had some difficulties here and if, if I stop, uh, Responding at some point, I have to reboot my computer. So just let me know somehow, send me an email or phone me, um, and I'll get things going. But anyway, so apologize for the technical problems. It was a disaster this weekend. Anyway, so I'm going to share my screen. I don't look like I'm looking at you because I'm looking at a monitor because I have no display on my computer. So it's a little weird, but uh, all you'll see is my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes, it's fine. Okay, so let the games begin. All right, so um, what I'd like to talk about today uh, is uh, what I term neuromechanical circuits of the spinal cord, and I'll explain why I use this particular term but basically, um, what I want to do is uh, go through a review of the, um, of the, uh, the pathways and functions of, uh, that arise from uh, receptors and muscles, um, primarily the muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs, and what role they might have in, uh, in motor control. And so um, going to the next slide, here are the main take-home messages that I'm hoping to impart. Uh, first of all, uh, the term neuromechanical circuits consist of reflexes plus their associated mechanical pathways. And the reason for this uh, rather peculiar statement is that uh, many uh, people... We didn't go to the next uh, slide. You didn't? No. No. You're not, you're, 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 not in, you're not in presentation mode. Perhaps I, that's... I, am, I actually am in presentation mode. Well, I guess that's on your computer, but then there's... This, the screen that you're projecting is the other the other screen. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, can you see this screen now? Not we see only we see just the PowerPoint uh, interface, not the presentation mode of that. But you see you see the uh, the the title slide, right? Yes. yes. Okay. And when I do this, do you see the next slide? Yes. Yes. For, so for some reason the presentation mode isn't working. So we'll just have to deal with this. If, if that, you're, that's if fine you're, this way, as long as you don't have animation. I think, yeah, the presentation mode goes to the other screen, probably for, uh, the non-existent screen. Oh, that's right. That's exactly what's happening in this other screen because these Mac computers are not made the way they used to be. 
Okay, so we'll just have to do it this way. Thank you for letting me know. Okay, um, the reason for the statement that neuromechanical circuits consist of reflexes plus their associated mechanical pathways is that oftentimes when people refer to reflexes, they think about a stimulus and response thing where you stimulate a nerve or you pull on a muscle or something and you get a response. And the idea of neuromechanical circuit is that the information coming out of the central nervous system goes into a, a very complicated mechanical system and the whatever variables, mechanical variables are produced then go through a series of transformations depending on those, um, the uh, musculoskeletal system, and then you get sensory feedback. So it forms a continuous loop. Um, so, and I have more to say about that particular issue in just a minute. The second main point is that uh, contrary to uh, some of the classical textbooks and papers, these circuits are anything but stereotyped. They're capable, in some cases, they are capable of predicting the mechanical states of muscles, and I'll go through that in a fair amount of detail. And they can also be modulated or reorganized according to motor task. Uh, third point is that these circuits are not generally modular. Uh, some of the classical ideas about reflex circuits is that they form modules, and we'll be talking about that in fair detail as well, but they form a distributed network in the spinal cord. Um, and uh, what I'd like to end up with is a proposal that I'm sure is controversial, but that these neuromechanical circuits function to regulate uh, the apparent, and I'm using the apparent uh, in deference to doctors Latash and Feldman, uh, the apparent impedance of the musculoskeletal system at muscle, joint, and limb levels. And I'm going to end up this talk with some very new data, which shows that um, contrary to many ideas, that the pathways in the spinal cord are actually take part in, um, in compensating for some of the more interesting intersegmental dynamics that go on in multi-joint movements. Uh, it's pretty exciting work and gives some uh, credence to the importance of spinal pathways. It's not all uh, either feed forward or long loop. Anyway, um, so the outline is, uh, because of technical reasons, I'm going to separate a little bit the discussion of muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs, and I'll be introducing them from scratch since this is a general audience. And then we'll talk about the integration of mechanical feedback in the spinal cord and what it might mean for, uh, um, for how, how, how the information from these receptors is integrated in the spinal cord. And we will be introducing some of our applications to understanding what's going on in spinal cord injury by way of uh, um, um, motor dysfunction. And then I'll wrap up with some final comments and summary comments and a reference to that new paper about the role of possible role of spinal uh, pathways in compensating for intersegmental dynamics, which is done in human subjects. Most of what I'm going to be talking about is from the animals and specifically cats. So uh, back to the idea of neuromechanical circuits. Um, uh, just for fun, I wanted to introduce this uh, really neat quote from John Dewey, who is an American philosopher, lived uh, uh, spanning the 19th and 20th centuries. And he was very disturbed by the dead psychological literature, which talked about reflex arcs, the idea you have a stimulus and then a response. And he talked about a child reaching out to a, a candle, a lit candle, and trying to grab the flame and getting burned and suddenly withdrawing. And so the idea is that the flame is hot, causes a flexion withdrawal reflex, and that's it. But he made the argument that the child is actually undergoing, is going through a very complex series of sensory motor transformations, which involve probably many areas of the, of the central nervous system, as well as the mechanics of the limbs. So he said the reflex arc idea as, as commonly employed is defective in that it assumes sensory stimulus and motor response as distinct psychical existences. He had a very interesting way of speaking. While in reality, they are always inside a coordination and have their significance purely from the part played in maintaining or reconstituting the coordination. So um, in more recent times, starting in the 60s and 70s and on to the present, 
people have been increasingly more rec recognizing the fact that in order to understand sensory pathways in the central nervous system, you have to understand the system which those pathways are, um, are, are regulating or controlling. It may be the heart, maybe the GI system, maybe the musculature. And uh, some of the early comments, there are many of them I could mention, but at some of the early points, Bernstein in his book in 1967, um, uh, made the load as, as an explicit part of the sensory motor loop. Uh, Partridge in the early 70s uh, talked about the, you know, the, uh, the, the fact that muscle and reflexes contribute together in load compensation. And Peter Rack talked about short-range stiffness and reflex action. We'll get to that a little bit later. So um, I'm going to start out by talking about uh, feedback from muscle spindle receptors and what these uh, and, and, and some of the neuromechanical circuits that arise from these, uh, these sensory receptors. And since some of you might be less familiar with uh, workings of the muscle spindle, I'm going to go through a very brief uh, discussion of that. Uh, the muscle spindle is basically a, a complex receptor um, in which the receptors themselves are um, uh, involve sensory nerve afferents and some modified muscle fibers called intrafusal fibers, all, um, all encased in a connective tissue capsule. And this whole structure in the human is around six to eight millimeters long, and it's connected overall and mechanically in parallel with, a, with the power producing muscle fibers, the extrafusal muscle fibers. And there are two kinds of, of receptors emanating from the spindle. There's the primary sensory afferent, which we're going to be focusing on today, which is the famous, uh, mediates the famous tendon jerk reflex. And there's also a secondary sensory receptor, which I will uh, mention a little bit toward the end of the presentation. Uh, since these are muscle fibers, they also receive a motor innervation. And there's lots to talk about them. Unfortunately, they're probably beyond the the scope of this discussion uh, of this presentation, but we can certainly discuss it if you'd like. I will be making some remarks about uh, possible role of the gamma system in, in just a little bit. Um, so the traditional idea is that there is something called the stretch reflex circuit, which consists of uh, muscle spindles in a muscle. Uh, they feed back uh, through the primary receptor through group 1a afferents so group 1a afferents conduct information from primary uh, sensory afferents in the spindle back into the spinal cord where that feedback is distributed up in the dorsal columns up to the cortex uh, through another set of pathways to the cerebellum and also into the um, uh, gray matter of the spinal cord um, leading to monosynaptic excitation of the same muscle that contained the parent muscle as well as synergistic muscles, and we'll have much more to say about synergists later on. In addition to that, um, there are inhibitory interneurons, which then uh, inhibit uh, muscles that we call antagonists because they have the opposite action. So spindle primary, the traditional view is that primary receptors detect length changes of the muscle, and they lead to recruitment and increased resistance to stretch through a simple negative feedback in the spinal cord, which is sort of anatomically laid out here. And Sherrington said that this, uh, this uh, pathway would help us to maintain upright stance. And uh, if you start, your muscles start fatiguing and you start falling, it'll bring you back up again. There's also this reciprocal inhibition circuit, uh, which uh, also contributes to the resistance of this joint to stretch. And the responses, uh, to some extent, may contribute to the tendon jerk response. We're not sure about that. But this whole system here, this little module, which controls the mechanics of the joint from the point of view of the muscle spindle, was termed the myotatic unit by DPC Lloyd in 1946. And that has become the standard way of explaining integrated uh, reflex control in the limb, and in uh, Lloyd's view, each joint has its own little myotetic unit. Um, uh, so that, uh, and then you just have to control the myotetic units in order to control the mechanical properties of the whole limb. And this is the, um, 
the, the type the concept that I want to uh, really hone in on today. So um, we can ask the question a little more precisely, what's regulated by the stretch reflex circuit? Now, if the sensitivity of the feedback is high enough, the regulation of length will result because after all, spindles are deemed to be length receptors. This was proposed in 1953 by Merton. But length regulation is inconsistent with the requirements of terrestrial locomotion where we do not want to have length regulation. We want to have spring-like uh, properties of our, of our limbs. Um, so the, the, uh, from that point of view, the, uh, the, the, the idea of, of length is, is not a good one. The other thing is the myotetic unit concept for the global regulation of the limb does not consider the actual structure and mechanics of the musculoskeletal system. So um, I'll be talking about these two second the, these two points here uh, in more detail, starting with with the second one, that length regulation. Uh, it does not seem to be what's regulated by this reflex circuit. And a lot of you are probably familiar with this material. I'm going to go through it fairly rapidly for the sake of people who are not familiar with it, but there may be some new ideas that emerge too that we can talk about later. So this again is the uh, is uh, from a paper by Jim Houck and uh, co-workers in 1981, which includes uh, work that I did with Jim Houck and attempts to uh, describe in more detail uh, what the uh, stretch reflex circuit is doing mechanically. And um, I think this is an illustration of true neuromechanics, where one tries to understand what a sensory pathway is doing in terms of the actual mechanical properties of the muscle that is included in the loop. So the Id idea is that if you have a muscle generating a certain amount of force, and you either stretch it or release it with a constant velocity stretch or release. If the muscle has no reflex attached to it, it goes through a very interesting, uh, it produces a very interesting response where the force goes up, uh, producing what's called short range stiffness, and then it yields, especially in slow twitch muscle, a um, uh, little bit less yielding in fast twitch muscle. And I'll have more to say about the physiological functions of yielding later on. Uh, but what's interesting is that if the stretch reflex is intact, the force keeps on going as if there were no break in the force trajectory. And then there's sort of a viscoelastic-like re uh, um, uh, relaxation. In response to release, the muscle shows um, a continuous decrease in force uh, rather than this yield because the yield is produced by the mechanical disengagement of cross bridges in the muscle. Now, notice that the contribution of the reflex is much greater during stretch than during release, and that's explained by the fact that the primary afferent from the muscle spindle is a much more vigorous response to stretch, both dynamically and statically, than it does to release, and that explains this asymmetry. The tonic component of this reflex response, by the way, as we talked about during Mindy's lecture, um, is probably supported by... Uh, um, persistent inward currents that are, are excited by in, on the motor neuron membrane in response to excitation of the motor neuron. Because as you can see, with the difference between the dynamic and static response, the static response probably isn't uh, vigorous enough to actually support uh, the tonic stretch reflex. So the other really remarkable thing about this is that notice there's no momentary yield before the reflex comes in. That is that the reflex is actually not responding to a quote-unquote error in the stiffness of the muscle. It actually preserves the stiffness that is set up by the short-range stiffness with no break whatsoever. And as a matter of fact, the, uh, the recruitment by the stretch reflex is already in motion before the yield occurs. So in other words, the regulation of stiffness in this case, which is the idea that Jim Houck had proposed, uh, is actually predictive. It's not a conventional negative feedback system. It's one that involves some prediction. So um, the result of the reflex is to make the muscle respond in a more viscoelastic-like manner. The other thing is that if you do this experiment at different background forces, as shown by Hoffer and Andreasen. Hey, uh, Richard, this, yeah. this DJ, could you just back up to the slide before for one sec? Yep. 
I just want, I mean, you have emphasized this point. I just want to also emphasize it. What a, a beautiful model the uh, the spindle is here, right? Yes. <clears throat> it's doing exactly the right thing to compensate for muscle in both directions. That's right. Exactly right. That's that was the first hint that the muscle is the, the muscle spindle is actually a predictor of what is going to actually happen to the muscle eventually. So it's actually a beautiful system. Uh, the muscle produces the initial response, which is called short range stiffness, and then the reflex takes over. And I'll have something else to say about that in just a bit. So the other thing is that the um, the reflex stiffness is a function of background tension which fits beautifully uh, with, uh, with the equilibrium point uh, notions of Anatole, uh, because you notice that in these torque angle trajectories in the human, that stiffness of the joint increases with force and length, which is predicted, maybe not quantitatively from, the, from these two pictures, this is from a decerebrate cat, and this is an intact human, but it shows that stiffness this one nonlinearity is actually very functionally important because um, the, um, the relationship between stiffness and force allows for the modulation of joint stiffness by co-contraction. Anyway, one could, uh, could, um, could cast some uh, doubt on this by saying, well, maybe the reflex just dumps in a bunch of, uh, just recruits a bunch of motor units regardless of conditions and maybe, um, maybe it's not all that big a deal it's maybe it's not all that predictive but before i get to um to that point i'll say just to quickly summarize the regulated apparent stiffness is, is uh, the, the stretch reflex circuit regulates apparent stiffness not length um because the apparent stiffness does not exceed short range stiffness it's compatible with the equilibrium point hypothesis tonic component is likely to be supported by persistent and recurrent and the apparent stiffness is regulated predictively, not by simple negative feedback. And this was, it was as proposed by Jim Houck, the muscle spindle could actually be regarded as a model reference system. It's kind of a little miniature model of the muscle itself, predicting how the muscle is going to behave under a given set of circumstances and compensates for um, those properties of the muscle. And the gamma system was proposed by Hauck, and again, we don't have time to go into this in detail, but his proposal was that the gamma system might actually adjust the parameters of the model reference system to make it appropriate under different sets of conditions. The other uh, functional point that um, uh, one might not think of, we think of the yielding of the muscle as being a defect or sort of a shortcoming in the mechanism muscle. It's actually not a shortcoming at all. What happens is, is the, the motor units that are active when you start stretching the muscle undergo a yield. They give their, their, um, their short range stiffness and then they yield, which actually serves a protective function. Then the reflex comes in and recruit, recruits more motor units so that the stresses that are, uh, the, to which the muscle is subjective are now distributed. you get uh, this beautiful system where the muscle uh, looks kind of like a viscoelastic spring, but yet there's this interesting uh, interplay between the mechanical properties of the muscle and the reflex. Now, to the point of uh, saying that, um, that this um, reflex is predictive, uh, more recently we, get, uh, we gathered some additional evidence on this point about whether it's really predictive or not. So the could question you, is... Could you maybe scale down a little bit because uh, the title of your slides is usually beyond the screen. I'm sorry, how's that? Uh, that's perfect, thank you. Good, thank you for letting me know. Um, and again, I apologize for all these technical glitches. Um, what if you were to ask the question, if you put the muscle under a condition where it does not yield, what would the reflex do then? It shouldn't do anything, right? So uh, my former student, Clotilde Duig de Puint, uh, did this experiment where she um, subjected the muscle to a, a, first to a, a, a release before she stretched it. So in this case up here in the upper left, is just like the case we looked at a minute ago. And that is the muscle is being constrained isometrically. You stretch it without reflex and you get this nice yielding response. 
you stretch it with a reflex and you get this nice reflex compensation. As you increase the magnitude of the prior shortening, notice that the muscle response itself becomes gradually more linear to the point where as where these, the release is as large as the stretch, the muscle's behaving intrinsically pretty much like a spring and the reflex adds nothing which actually suggests, and uh, we've done all sorts of control experiments to show that this doesn't have to do with initial forces and all that kind of stuff. So um, the, mus the muscle spindle is truly acting as a predictive mechanism. So there are complementary properties between intrafusal and extrafusal muscle, uh, and they are, uh, they are both modified together depending on, this, on, the, on the given situation. Um, we actually verified that this was uh, functionally important by doing a knockout experiment where you can actually knock out the stretch reflex of a muscle. This is a technique um, that discovered by Tim Cope by, um, by transecting the nerve to the muscle and then repairing it and waiting nine months while the muscle becomes re -innervated. It ends up with some very interesting reasons without a stretch reflex. And in animals doing different kinds of activities, we found that they were, the locomotion was only affected when the animals were going downhill. Um, when the animals were walking on the level or walking uphill, their, their, their locomotion, and th these were re of the tricep surrey muscles. Sorry. Uh, the only time that you saw any defect in locomotion was when the animals went downhill. So, if you consider these upper two panels as corresponding to what happens during downslope walking, the reflex is contributing a significant amount to the response of the muscle. During level and upslope walking, there's relatively little contribution from the stretch reflex, and you get relatively little uh, effect from the loss of the stretch reflex. So just to wrap up this section on the muscle spindle, uh, the history-dependent properties of muscle spindles explain their predictive actions. And this is from data from Tim Cope's laboratory. Valerie Haftel in 2003 showed this really nice uh, uh, figure. Uh, this is from rat spindles, where they're doing intra-axonal recordings from spindles, where if you stretch the, uh, the muscle with a series of triangles and you record from the muscle spindle receptors, it's only on that first stretch where you get really very high firing rates and this initial burst when you stretch this, when you keep the muscle moving on subsequent triangles you get an increase in in firing rate but it's not anywhere near as large as the as the firing rate that you get um, particularly initially uh, on that first stretch and if you do the same experiment in a deserved cat where there's active gamma um, firing you get a, essentially the same thing, but it's much noisier, noisier as one might expect. And down here is a Golgi tenor organ, which, which shows basically no history dependence whatsoever. And we'll get to that a little bit later. So, uh, Richard? Yeah, yep. Yeah. So presumably in the December experiments, gamma drive is more or less constant, right? So this isn't a function yeah. of gamma drive. Yeah, I mean, something is, uh, uh, again, I don't know exactly where the noise is. The only the only thing I can say is that under these conditions, we know that the gamma drive is active, where it was not active over here in the anesthetized animal. But, no, I, I just meant the the beautiful adaptations of the of the spindle firing and the reflex response are intrinsic to the spindle under levels of constant, presumably constant gamma drive. Yes. 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 Right. 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 Yep. So um, I just want to wrap up this section on the spindle because we want to get onto the tendon organ soon. Um, but now comes uh, the other thing that, that kind of interferes with the traditional viewpoint. The monosynaptic pathways are both autogenic and heterogenic. That is, they extend not only to synergists, but also to distant muscles. So uh, one eye afferents project to synergistic motor units as well as muscles crossing different joints. And we'll be showing some examples of that later. Group two afferents from the spindle project primarily to other muscles, the group two afferents from the secondary spindle receptors. And uh, unfortunately, we won't have time to say a lot about those, but I can answer questions about them. Uh, these projections link muscles with primarily slow twitch motor units. So it's known that the uh, the the 
uh, the monosynaptic reflex to a muscle projects more heavily to slow twitch motor units to fast twitch units and the intermuscular pathways also obey the same generalization which is kind of interesting uh, interjoint monosynaptic connections are more common in the feline and human forelimb than in the hind limb but they're present in both limbs and uh, Monosynaptic connections are not generally correlated with muscle synergies, but are probably more related to responses to perturbation. Uh, this observation about the wide distribution of monosynaptic pathways, uh, as well as some other issues that I, I don't have time to get into, led uh, Eccles and Lindbergh in 1958 to say that the myotidic unit concept of Lloyd is basically untenable, and basically people have not really picked that idea up until quite recently. These are just figures, and I don't want you to try to understand these figures, from a book called The Circuitry of the Human uh, Spinal Cord by Pierre de Serigny and Burke, in which they compare the human and the cat and show that there are many uh, cross-joint and intramuscular monosynaptic connections um, in both the hind or forelimb or upper or, uh, excuse me, the upper or forelimb or the hind or lower limb. And we'll deal with that question a little bit later. Now I want to move on to the tendon organ. Um, the tendon organ is uh, at the level of the receptor is not quite as fancy as the spindle. Uh, this is a diagram from the Kendall and Schwartz textbook. Uh, shows that the 1B afferent that's connected to the tendon organ actually branches into a reticulum of collagen fibers. And when you when the muscle is generating active tension, these fibers straighten out, push on the 1B axons and cause firing. And you can see the tendon organs are um, uh, mechanically connected in series of muscle fibers, and uh, therefore they are considered force receptors. And it was shown by Jim Houck that a single motor unit was capable of activating a tendon organ. So they're highly sensitive. And this also is a, um, figure from uh, the paper by Hauk and Henneman that uh, pointed this out and showed that if you show the firing of a tendon organ against the force in the muscle uh, that's produced by um, uh, subfused contractions of uh, motor units, that you could fit the response of the spindle by a, a, a two, exponential, um, two exponential functions meaning that the tendon organ is responding to force and the derivative of force, which I now understand from some recent uh, interesting literature is called yank. So tendon organs respond to force and yank. Uh, so most of the magic with the tendon organ pathways uh, happens within the spinal cord and elsewhere in the central nervous system uh, and not uh, out there in the periphery. Um, they're basically force receptors as far as we know. So they send impulses back to the spinal cord. And another, and this is a simplified diagram from the Kandel uh, textbook again. And of course, um, these uh, receptors do not uh, project, or the 1B afferents do not project monosynaptically. They go through interneurons and then to the motor neurons and back to muscles. Um, the interesting thing is that under some resting, so-called resting conditions, these, these interneurons are inhibitory. And they have been labeled 1B inhibitory interneurons. And I'll, I'll say something later at the end of the talk about the classification of interneurons, which again is undergoing kind of a revolution from the work of Elsby to Jankowska and others. But during locomotion, uh, this is, uh, these are really interesting intracellular recordings done in fictively locomoting animals. That is, the, the animal's central pattern generator is going, but the animal is fully paralyzed. It's decerebrate and paralyzed, so it's not unethical. Um, and during locomotion, it was observed that there's a transformation between this inhibitory pathway to an excitatory pathway. And so the, 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 tr the traditional view became that 1B afferents project to 1B interneurons, and that uh, when you go from rest to locomotion, there's a wholesale conversion of inhibition to excitation. Um, and this was deemed uh, by Jacques Dyson, who was one of the early workers in this area, and others as a loading reflex. So the idea is that when you're 
locomoting and you're beginning to deal with heavier loads and inertial forces, you need to uh, amp up the forces output of muscles. And so you turn on this excitatory pathway, which is positive feedback, which helps you deal with those increased loads. So uh, I'll get back to that question in just a bit. But the next question is, what about the wiring diagram in the spinal cord? And that's where things get really interesting. So inhibitory force feedback is mainly distributed across joints and axes of rotation. I won't go through all the experimental data, but these three gentlemen down here, John Lawrence, Steve Bonacera, and Ronnie Wilmink, were responsible for generating this graph that represents three doctoral dissertations between the this shows a mechanical diagram of the ankle joint and the knee joint showing the torques that are produced by different muscles in two different directions of motion, just so you could have a way of seeing how these muscles are organized mechanically. And they're grouped into little synergistic groups linked by, guess what, monosynaptic 1A feedback. The bottom line of this, of this whole series of uh, studies is that the inhibitory force feedback pathways, which were studied in decerebrate animals uh, without locomotion, are all inhibitory, and they tend to link synergistic groups. So the quadriceps are linked to the triceps surrey, the triceps surrey are linked to the um, ankle um, uh, abductors, and so forth. So the general rule is that the inhibitory force feedback links muscles across joints and axes of rotation. And some of the earlier work that led to some of these pathways, of course, was done by none other than Sir John Eccles and his co-workers back in, in the 1950s. Uh, this uh, anatomical diagram here is based on a nice model constructed by Hub Moss and his, uh, and his uh, technician, Hus Ban. And uh, these muscles are colored in in blue to show that they're mutually inhibitory. So here we have the quadriceps group up here. And down here, we have the triceps surrey. These muscles inhibit each other um, through these pathways, which is really kind of exciting. And this is kind of where I want to go uh, in this talk. So what we want to do is to get a little bit more sophisticated and quantitative about this, about these uh, intermuscular distributions. So to lead off, I wanted to point out, and again, using the Bond's uh, nice anatomical model, you can see that the muscles in the feline hind limb, this is lateral view and medial view, are very complex in their attachments. Some of them cross uh, more than one joint. So here's the biceps femoris muscle, which goes from the iliac, uh, uh, from the ischial tuberosity to the tibia, and parts of it cause hip extension, and the other parts of it down here cause a combination of hip extension and knee flexion, which is essentially limb retraction, all in the same muscle. And some muscles have very interesting courses and, and, and so forth. I'm sure you're all aware of the complexity of, of the uh, mammalian um, uh, musculoskeletal anatomy. So how do we, in the spirit of trying to assemble circuitry, how do we assemble the mechanical uh, properties of the musculature with the neural connections between them. So the anatomical coupling between muscles, and which means viscoelastic coupling, is based on the moment arms at different joints and about different axes of rotations. Muscles have primary and secondary actions. In some cases, they may cross more than one joint. In some cases, they may cross more than one axis of rotation and, and combinations of those two. So, the moment arms of most of the hind limb muscles at each joint were measured initially by Tom Burkholder and later on by a student, Nate Bunderson, um, and fit to a seven degree of freedom anatomical model. So the hip joint having three degrees of freedom, the knee joint having two degrees of freedom, and the ankle joint having two degrees of freedom. For all muscle pairs, all 31 muscles that, that we looked at, the similarities or dissimilarities of moment arms were calculated as the cosine of the angle between the two moment arm vectors. So you can think of each moment arm vector as being in a seven dimensional space because there are seven degrees of freedom. So a given moment arm of a given muscle might not 
might not have any components in a given axis of, uh, in a given uh, plane. But nonetheless, you can represent all 31 muscles if you have a seven degree of freedom um, uh, coordinate system. The muscles were arranged in a matrix according to a, in, and they were ordered according to a hierarchical cluster, hierarchical cluster analysis, and I won't go through the gory details, but the result was this really lovely diagram that shows the mechanical similarities and dissim dissimilarities of muscles. So going down the diagonal of the matrix, here's the cluster analysis over here. Um, these, uh, the, the, the way these muscles were ordered were not based on our, just our subjective notions of anatomy. They were actually done according to their similarities of moment arms. You can see down the diagonal, all these red groups of muscles uh, are the synergistic groups that we all recognize. Here's the tricep surrey, uh, here's the quadriceps, and here's a really complicated one that involves a lot of the comp complex muscles of the of the hip and knee. And you can see that the idea of perfect uh, synergism breaks down quite a bit here. There's, there are bits of antagonism, bits of synergism of various strengths all mixed in here. Out here in the blue, of course, are the muscles with antagonistic actions. And so this gives you a quasi myotetic unit idea, but the problem is that muscles have overlapping functions, and according to uh, Lloyd's model, um, you can't have a muscle member, um, a member of more than one myotetic unit, and so on and so forth, and that rule is, is actually not, not obeyed in the real musculoskeletal system. Anyway, what we had done was to take this uh, mechanical similarity diagram, and then we compared it to a matrix with the same axes uh, that shows the, uh, the connections between these muscles of, of, in the spinal cord. And so here's the mechanical diagram over here again, and here's the length feedback path, uh, the length feedback diagram, which muscles are linked by short latency length feedback, probably mostly 1A feedback, but we can't rule out the possibility that there might be some group two contribution as well. Anyway, the point of the uh, point of this is that you can sort of see the patterns and the mechanical diagram reflected in the reflex diagram. Um, here are um, uh, synergistic groups here, and the synergies are established by these linkages, which vary in strength. Although when you get to the muscles of the hip, they become a little more scattered. And over here are in blue are the inhibitory ones that correspond to these inhibitory areas in the mechanical diagram. But there are some interesting uh, exceptions here. Uh, there are some cases where you have um, muscles down here in the dissimilarity area, mechanically, that are actually producing excitatory inputs. These are data from Sir John Eccles. And also up here in this dissimilarity region. And this little one right here, this little red square here, represents the um, the feedback from the slow twitch vastus intermedius muscle up in the knee to the soleus muscle at the ankle joint. So this is, uh, and it's actually a very powerful pathway. And there are some other exceptions here. So there's kind of a quasi myotetic organization here, but you can see there are, there are, there are lots of exceptions. Now, when we go to the force feedback, here again is the same mechanical diagram one can see that these uh, pathways uh, show a somewhat different organization. Uh, these inhibitory pathways here um, do not correspond to the traditional antagonists. They seem to be, whoops, sorry about that. Um, they seem to be um, um, in areas that are predominantly green in the mechanical diagram, which means these muscles have no, um, no immediate mechanical uh, relationship, and yet there's force feedback going between those muscles. So that's one thing. And then if we look at the synergistic groups of the tricep surrey up here and the quadriceps, we can see there is inhibitory feedback between members of these synergistic groups, um, particularly uh, in, in, in the quadriceps uh, group here, which is the easiest one to describe. Uh, if you look at this more carefully, and we don't need to go into a whole much of detail, the point, of the, uh, the point of this is that the three um, vastus muscles that are single joint muscles 
don't share any inhibitory feedback, but they do it. They do share inhibitory feedback with a rectus femoris muscle, which is a two joint muscle crossing the hip. In other words, the force feedback is linking muscles that cross different joints and different axes of rotation. The other interesting thing is there are some excitatory pathways which appear even without locomotion. <clears throat> and these were also noted by um, Eccles in the 1950s. Um, the yellow and red also uh, represent these. And uh, what one notices here is that there are, say, an example of the pre-tibial flexors, uh, tibialis anterior and EDL, are receiving um, excitation from their antagonists, the triceps surrey, uh, from muscles of the hip and also the, qu the quadriceps muscles. So there's this convergent excitation onto the, um, the pre-tibial flexors. And our, our guess as to what this is all about is that in the uh, terminal stages of the stance phase during locomotion, um, when uh, these muscles of propulsion are contracting vigorously, uh, they begin to recruit the pretibial flexors, which will become important uh, during the subsequent swing phase. But even more, perhaps more importantly, during very rapid locomotion, there is an increasing co-contraction between the pretibial flexors and the muscles of propulsion uh, during the latter part of the stance phase, which serves the purpose not only of preparing for this, uh, the subsequent swing phase, but also terminating, decelerating the forward motion of the limb uh, by co-contraction. And then the pre tibial flexors are already on, ready to uh, mediate the swing phase proper. And the same arguments can be applied to these guys up here, which are the posterior biceps femoris and the semitendinosus, which are important muscles of, um, of, um, of propulsion. Richard? Yep, yep. Uh, so Sergei Yakovenko and Arthur Prochaska pointed out that uh, anatomically, it's odd that the, for example, the gluteal motor pools reside in the same portion of the of the lumbar cord as the ankle extensors and flexors, and, and he, he called those were he called retractors. Is that what you mean as retractors? Uh, what I mean is that the say the uh, the posterior biceps femoris and semitendinosus retract the leg in the sagittal plane. Um, the gluteal muscles in the cat, the gluteal, gluteus medius is the big one, not the gluteus maximus, and it's primarily responsible for frontal plane control. And it's really interesting that the motor neurons are located in, in that particular location. Uh, uh, it would be interesting to know if the gluteal muscle motor neurons are located in the same region as the motor neurons going to the ankle stabilizers, because these muscles are all coactivated during the stance phase because the, uh, the cat is digitigrade, stands on his or her toes. And so the ankle joint, as well as the hip joint, have to be stabilized, and the the stabilizers come on. So I'm, I'm just wondering if um, if that could be a correlation too. But I don't remember enough of their data to, to know that. I'll look at it. What are you calling the ankle stabilizers? Uh, peroneus brevis and tibialis posterior primarily. Okay, thanks. So um, anyway. The, the idea is that the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the feedback from the muscle spindle, at least from the primary ending, seems to go along approximately along the lines of, um, of, um, of synergism and, and, and antagonism with some very important exceptions. And if you look at the diagram from Piero Desidini and others, you'll and uh, uh, Michael Illert, who is uh, primarily responsible for mapping monosynaptic pathways in the cat forelimb, that these uh, monosynaptic pathways are really common, much more common than in the hind limb. So um, in order to come up with a general idea of what these pathways are contributing to the regulation of the limb, um, we have to take these into account. The system is definitely mo not modular, which is the main conclusion here. This is just a diagram to show you in a little more graphic terms, these uh, excitatory pathways. Over on, the, the muscles in the red are the ones that donate inhibitory force feedback. 
And by the way, I will have some comments about positive force feedback later. And the muscle in green, the muscles in green are the recipients. So the pretibial flexors here receive convergent excitation from all of these different muscles. And over here, showing the biceps uh, femoris muscle of the cat receives convergent um, inhibitory feedback from uh, the muscles in red, red. And down here, I've already made the argument about, uh, about locomotion. So I need to move along here in order to finish on time. But please break in if you have some uh, questions, of course. So now, now the question is, once we've seen that there is this intermuscular distribution, the question is, is this organization of force feedback flexible? And of course, I wouldn't probably raise the question unless there was an interesting answer to that. Um, is the distribution of the feedback, does it change? In other words, are different muscles connected together under different tasks? And or do the strengths of the individual link linkages change with task? So as a first uh, hint about this, uh, Mark Lyle, a former postdoc of mine, um, um, uh, did a series of experiments, in the, again, on the decerebrate animal. And I'll make some comments about the, the utility of the decerebrate, of the data from the decerebrate animals a little bit later. He mapped the distribution of, force fee of inhibitory force feedback among uh, se several groups of muscles, and four are shown here. The vastus muscles, single joint knee extensors, the flexor helicus longus, the, uh, the, um, which is a, a plantar flexor of the ankle and a flexor of the toes, plantaris and the gastric nemius muscles, which are uh, multi-joint muscles crossing the knee ankle, and in the case of plantaris, also the metatarsal phalangeal joint. And so these, the, the size of these arrows uh, indicates just subjectively the, um, the strength of the inhibitory feedback. And we're actually doing this uh, properly quantitatively now with a machine learning uh, 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 project uh, uh, led by my graduate student, Shay McMurtry. But this is, gives you a, con, a, a sort of a, a conceptual idea of what's going on. Mark found three basic patterns, well, a spectrum of patterns, but there were three that sort of stood out as common patterns across animals and across limbs and, 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 and so forth, in about 10 or 12 animals, I think. The first pattern, the arrows go in various directions, but if you, if you look at it carefully, you'll see that the weight of the inhibition is focused on the distal musculature, particularly the FHL. There is some balance feedback here between FHL and gastrocnemius, and there's balance feedback between gastrocnemius and plantaris, but the other lines adding up give you more of a sort of a proximal to distal uh, kind of, generally speaking, uh, generally speaking uh, a gradient. At the other extreme, you have in other animals, and they are very consistent within animals, which of course are different because they're the preparations are different, and one might expect some different patterns, so this may not be very surprising. We find that most of the inhibition is directed proximally from distal sources. And then there was a very interesting pattern here in the middle, where most of the feedback is directed toward these muscles crossing the knee and the ankle joint, particularly the gastrocnemius, which we call a convergent pattern. So the question is, do these have any physiological relevance at all? Or do these patterns, are they simply an artifact of the way we did the decerebration and how we manipulated the brainstem? Regardless, so, Martin, Richard, yeah. Richard, these patterns were just amongst the variants of the preparation or something? Or? Yeah, yeah. In one animal, we'd see predominantly pattern one throughout the experiment. In another animal, we'd see predominantly pattern three. They were very consistent within animal. So they may be artifacts of the neurosurgery that we did. Who knows? But the fact of the matter is that the spinal cord was capable of medi of 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 of, of, um, of, of um, exhibiting these different patterns. So there's some kind of of uh, flexibility going on. We don't know whether it's physiological or pathological. Okay. So. Uh, Kyla Ross, a, pr a former uh, PhD student of mine. Uh, did an experiment where she did the same experiment, except not in a quiescent decerebrate animal. She did it in a premammillary decerebrate animal, which exhibits 
locomotion, stepping on a treadmill. So you do the decerebration, you allow the animal to come out of anesthesia, start the treadmill, and it'll start walking and producing absolutely beautiful locomotion, if you're lucky. And she uh, immobilized one limb, as Keir Pearson had done in some of his famous studies, and did the force feedback mapping um, experiment. And I'll give you a little bit of methods in, in, in just a bit. But what she found was, during stepping, very consistently, she found a basically proximal to distal uh, gradient of force of inhibitory force feedback during locomotion. So first of all, she demonstrated that during uh, locomotion, in the same experiments that were done by others, um, that is, spontaneously locomoting deserved cats or effectively locomoting deserved cats, she did not find that the inhibitory feedback was, was, um, was suppressed. In fact, it was very much alive and well. She did see excitatory force feedback. But it was purely autogenic, and it only appeared in one muscle group, the gastrocnemius muscle group. Other than that, all the intramuscular pathways remained inhibitory, which began to make us think that these inhibitory pathways are very important for somehow regulating the, the relative mechanics of the joints to, uh, to tune the, not only the, the impedance of the, of the limb as a whole uh, in its interactions with the outside world, but the distribution of impedances among the joints to maintain uh, proportional coordination so that muscles could remain within their normal ranges of locomotion. Um, so what she showed is during this task, she didn't see uh, this variety of patterns, even though these were animals with different, slightly different uh, transections. She found one particular one when there was a defined behavior. So that made us, that began to make us think that um, in fact, these different patterns might, might in fact have some physiological relevance. If you have a proximal to distal gradient, it might be that the purpose, and this is during slow walking, the experiments are done during slow walking on a treadmill, it might be that one might, might want to make the terminal uh, joints more compliant to make a better mechani mechanical interface with the outside world. This is actually an argument that was made by Andy B. Wenner and Monica Daly some years ago from their studies in the guinea fowl. The, there may be a further modulation uh, of the organization or strength of force feedback uh, for downslope walking. And I, I don't, unfortunately, have time to go through this story. But a um, uh, uh, former postdoc, Ginger Gottschall, who might be familiar to some of you uh, in my uh, laboratory, was investigating the effects of uh, vestibular and neck afferent um, um, input into the central pattern generator and found that she could explain some of the really interesting patterns of muscular activation that are shown by the, the hind limb muscles of the cat um, when the animal was, was undergoing different kinds of, uh, of locomotion, either uphill or downhill locomotion. Uh, those initial studies were done by Judy Smith in an intact cat showing the changes in muscular activity. And again, I don't have time to go into the details unless you wanted to discuss it later. But what Ginger discovered is that she could actually duplicate for uh, a, a, a few muscles, one, some of the most important ones that change their activation patterns between level and downhill walking. She could actually cause those changes to take place by manipulating the vestibular and neck afferent information. In other words, what was happening is that the classical uh, tonic neck and tonic labyrinthine uh, inputs that were studied by um, uh, cl um, 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 uh, decline and um, yeah, sorry, Magnus back in the turn of the uh, 19th, 20th century, were actually regulating the central pattern generator, not just uh, not just posture of the animal. So, uh, a graduate student of mine, uh, Christopher Tuttle, uh, did some experiments using the um, the uh, force feedback mapping. And he showed that the uh, putting the animal into the downhill mode caused a further increase in the in the uh, not only in the strength of inhibitory force feedback but in the compliance of the limb. And uh, according to my engineering colleagues, you really want uh, increased compliance walking downhill to uh, 
provide a more compliant interface with the outside world. These mapping experiments, by the way, are done in the following way. You have a decerebrate animal that's still anesthetized. You dissect out the tendons of selected muscles. You immobilize the limb, hook the muscles up to uh, linear motors, and then you stretch them according to um, the following paradigm. You activate the muscles through some kind of pathway cross extension reflex or something. And as the force decays, you stretch uh, the primary muscle which might be this red one down here, uh, repeatedly, and you get these uh, stretch responses. And on every other one, you stretch a different muscle, maybe this one up here, the gastrocnemius muscle. And every time you stretch the gastrocnemius muscle, you notice the response of the primary muscle, the recipient, we call it, is smaller than it was when it was stretched by itself. Then you collect all the data points for the state ones and the state two responses, and they form two nice populations, which you can uh, um, statistically distinguish. And you can see that there is a, uh, a an inhibition coming from the FHL muscle to the from the FHL muscle to the gastrocnemius muscle, which increases uh, somewhat with force. And so that's the way these mapping experiments done. Then you go on to the next pair of muscles and you do this for 10 or 15 years and you end up with mappings of force feedback for a variety of muscles. And um, okay, what Chris found was here's a, a force plot from the kind of data I just showed you showing the inhibition from the state one to the state two responses that you get uh, for this particular muscle, uh, for a different muscle combination, gastrocnemius to FHL. And when you put the animal into this fictive downhill mode, the inhibition became significantly greater. And uh, Chris has uh, written his thesis and these, these data are yet to be published formally. Uh, this turned out to be a consistent finding and we've done a lot of controls to show that this was indeed an increase in inhibitory force feedback Chris also measured the stiffness of the hind limbs of some of these animals where they, that were not dissected and did the same manipulation of the um, vestibular and neck afferent system and found that the stiffness of the limb actually decreased as well. So the idea that inhibitory force feedback is involved in uh, tuning the apparent mechanical um, impedance or stiffness of the limb uh, was supported by these studies. So, we then uh, have been developing this idea that, um, um, that perhaps this inhibitory force feedback, since it's uh, strictly uh, seems to be linking uh, muscles across joints and across axes of rotation, there is some weak autogenic force feedback within a muscle. Actually, Granite studied it back in 1950, late 40s and 50, but it's fairly weak in the hands of, of many researchers. Um, so, what I want to move on to now, and I'll try to wrap this up toward the end to give you more of an idea of, of the hypotheses that we're talking about, uh, but we wanted to get some more data first. We decided to translate these studies to a uh, clinical situation. And so we teamed up with, uh, actually, it wasn't my idea initially, but it was Dina Howland's idea at the University of Louisville to get together because she's, uh, as you probably know, is a world-renowned researcher in spinal cord injury research and has been studying the feline models. She's an expert at doing very precise spinal cord injuries. She's an expert at uh, kinematic analysis of animal behavior and training. And she's also an expert in the histochemistry of the spinal cord. We got together because what we can supply is the um, the physiology of the pathways. And so the way this, uh, this uh, collaboration works is the animals are trained to walk on different surfaces, either level surfaces, treadmills, or downhill, uh, because there's something that we think is special about downhill locomotion, as I've in implied along the way. These animals are then given a thoracic spinal hemisection, that is, uh, she cuts halfway through the spinal cord so that there's a full complement of pathways on one side, but they're blocked on the other side. It's done on the thoracic level, so the lumbar spinal cord is not directly affected by the lesion. And then 
We wanted to see the effects of this injury on the organization of force feedback. And then we wanted to go on uh, and uh, after those initial studies, which I will briefly outline, we then have gone on to the current study, which is to see that if eccentric training, that is training on a task where we know there's some modulation of force feedback would be effective in restoring the organization of feedback toward normal. So I'll get to a brief summary of those data in a bit. But here's an example of some of the data. So I've already introduced you to the, the methodology. This was a study, a dissertation of uh, Iram Niazi, um, a student of mine from Pakistan, who um, did a very, very nice study. And what she did is to look at the, um, the effect of one muscle on another one. Here we have gastric nemius and FHL again, two of our favorite muscles. So we did our little two-state sequence from gastric nemius to FHL, and then from FHL to gastric nemius. And you can see there's modest but uh, consistent inhibition in both directions. And if you take any two of these responses and just superimpose them, you can see there's significant but modest inhibition in one direction and also in the other direction. So that's an example of balanced inhibition, and I showed you uh, examples of that in those uh, diagrams from uh, Mark Lyle. If you look at, uh, if you then do the analysis that, like Chris Tuttle did, um, in which case you look at the force dependence of these things, again, you can see the, auto, the state one responses here and the state two responses. There's nice uh, force dependent inhibition in both directions and both about the same magnitude. If you compare that with what happens after spinal hemisection, first of all, for this particular muscle combination, the inhibition now is very highly biased and becomes exaggerated in one direction or the other. Now, back in the 50s, uh, Eccles again and his co-workers showed that spinal cord injury acutely can cause an increase in inhibition in the spinal cord. What we've added to that story is that there is an increased inhibition, but it's not it's not across the board, it's uh, in, a, in particular directions between particular muscles in this particular case. If we then look at the force plots from the control case and the after the lateral hemisection, we can see that here's this nice balanced inhibition in the control case, and in this case, after spinal cord injury, we show this very highly biased inhibition. And this pattern of inhibition uh, this highly biased nature where you have a, a large increase in inhibition in, in, one, in, in one direction between any two muscles and in, in very little inhibition in the other thing became a general, a general finding. And what we discovered was in the spinally injured animals, the pattern that was exhibited was a single pattern that corresponded to this pattern to the so-called convergent pattern. So everybody's ganging up on the gastric nemius muscle after spinal cord injury. These muscles are very strongly inhibited and we think might be a, a, a good uh, reason for, uh, for the motor deficits, which I can't go into in much detail because there's some blinding going on between the two laboratories so that we come up to our conclusions independently, but I will talk a little bit about, about this. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, an enorm a very e excellent project done by a student, Elma Kaitaz, who, uh, from Bosnia, who completed her dissertation last year at Georgia Tech, worked with C.J. Heckman, too, um, who did this uh, study of these four muscles uh, modeled after Mark Lyle's study, where she looked at the effects of, of um, spinal cord injury. And now after this lesion, we see only one pattern exhibited. Now, um, the effect of eccentric training. This is where things really got interesting. Following spinal hemisection and eccentric training, more than one pattern of force feedback was observed similar to control animals. Well, that's kind of a tentative statement. Uh, we've done, uh, I think, 12 or 13 animals so far, and that seems to be the case. We don't see this one single, uh, one single pattern that is shown um, after uh, lateral hemisection with no training. Following training on a level surface or a treadmill, the results were indistinguishable from those obtained from untrained animals. 
Now, my student, Shay McMurtry, who is leading this project, was able to decide correctly in most cases which man animals had been eccentrically trained solely on the basis of the physiological data on the reflex mapping. She was actually unaware of which animals had been trained or untrained and was unaware of any of the kinesiological data. So that means that the, uh, the potential rehabilitation um, uh, consequences of this might actually be that, that specific eccentric training is, uh, can be of benefit to, uh, to uh, rehabilitation of the patients with partial spinal cord injury. Uh, that's uh, the correlation with the kinesiology is ongoing. Uh, we're being supported by the Veterans Administration to, to do this. So that's kind of uh, where, where we are with that particular study. But it's kind of, it's beginning to suggest that the various patterns that we saw in the quiescent cerebral animals were not actually um, just, uh, just uh, resulting from the pathology of the decerebration. It may be that actually these pathways, um, this flexibility in these pathways actually has uh, some physiological import, as suggested by the locomotion studies of Kyla Ross and the studies of uh, Chris Tuttle, where he manipulated the descending uh, um, body orientation signal. Okay, um, I can't really get into this too much, but we now have this idea that um, information from spindles and tendon organs is converging on the spinal cord. And of course, it was suggested a long time ago by Jim Houck that the convergence of uh, length and force feedback from these two receptors, uh, length feedback in quotes, because we know that the response of the muscle spindle is very complex and nonlinear. It's a model reference system rather than a simple, uh, simple representation of muscular length. But... Um, there was a study uh, out of Tim Cope's laboratory where they looked at the, uh, at the terminations of the feedback from different categories of, of uh, sensory afferents coming from the corresponding receptors in muscle, 1A and group 2 from spindles and 1B from Golgi tendon organs, and showed that, as one would expect, the ventral horn where all the motor neurons are, a very dense uh, uh, concentration of 1A afferents that mediate the, the, the tonic stretch reflex, of course, and some group twos as well. No 1Bs down here because 1Bs end up in inter, inner neurons. And so if you go into this deep dorsal horn, as we call it, in uh, uh, laminae five and six of the spinal cord, there's no, there's no, there are no distinct anatomically separated populations of inner neurons. They're receiving inputs from 1As, group 2s, and 1Bs. And there was a paper published by Elsbieta Jankowska and Steve Edgley back in 2010, where they went away from this idea that we have 1B interneurons, group 2 interneurons, a reciprocal, one, well, there are probably reciprocal 1A interneurons, which mediate reciprocal inhibition, which are down here. But between the group 2 and the 1B and the 1A and the deep dorsal horn, they form a continuum, a single population. But within that continuum, it's kind of like a, a series of Venn diagrams where you have some motor, some interneurons which are predominantly receive, let's say, group 1A and 1B, others which receive predominantly group 2, and some that receive both group 2 and 1B. So instead of these different functional classes, there's a, a, a single population of inner neurons, um, which um, which mediates this this uh, feedback to motor neurons. So if you think about the musculoskeletal system, it's not modular. Um, muscles cross more than one joint, and they interact by inertial forces through uh, inertial coupling, which is definitely a, not a modular feature of the of the of the uh, musculoskeletal system, as pointed by Felix Zajac a long time ago. The, uh, the feedback from these receptors to motor neurons is widely distributed through the spinal cord. And if you look at the, at the, uh, at the anatomical substrate for these pathways, some of which may be monosynaptic, but some of which are probably going through the deep dorsal horn, they are widely distributed as well. There's a lot of convergence and divergence. So 
I guess the conclusion from this, then, in my mind, is that uh, we need to consider the musculature, uh, at least at the peripheral end of things, down at the level of the spinal segment and the musculoskeletal system itself, as a distributed network. There may be modular aspects to the way the nervous, the motor system is organized, taken as a whole. Um, learning different motor tasks might take advantage of modules, for example. But when you get closer to the musculoskeletal system, then things begin to look more parallel distributed than they do um, hierarchical and uh, modular. So uh, sensory inputs are ultimately integrated at the level of the motor neuron. In the deep dorsal horn, a population of interneurons receive a spectrum of inputs from spindle primary and secondary receptors and from Golgi tendon organs. And I haven't mentioned them yet because there wasn't time, cutaneous and joint receptors. There are probably not designated interneurons for specific receptor types. There's a single population with varying contributions from the different receptor types. And so it's a challenge uh, for neurophysiology to try to sort this out and, and come up with a wiring diagram where we go from receptor and muscle back to muscle uh, that sort of lays out how these pathways are organized and more, more and, and also importantly, how they are regulated according to uh, different motor tasks. So um, the original hypothesis of Hauck was the, the regulation of stiffness of individual muscles due to convergent feedback from spindles and tenor organs. Um, subsequent studies show that the regulation of the stiffness of an individual muscle results from the actions of the primary spindle receptor through the stretch reflex circuit and not through this convergent input because the inhibitory feedback from the tenon organ is relatively weak back to the same muscle. Um, however, the spring constant that the muscle exhibits, the, so, the apparent spring constant, excuse me, Mark, the apparent spring constant that is exhibited by the muscle is going to be a result not only of the, of the uh, regulatory actions of the, of, the, of the stretch reflex circuit, but also of the other convergent sensory inputs coming in. So the more global regulation of limb mechanics is probably arising from the sensory integration in the deep dorsal horn and probably involves uh, uh, contributions from 1A, 1B, and group two receptors. So this suggests my suggested role for distributed feedback in the spinal cord is, uh, is um, that since the muscular mechanical pathways of the musculoskeletal system, um, the, the muscles are linked through viscoelastic and inertial coupling. They are complemented by distributed feedback from muscle and other receptors. The intermuscular feedback from muscle receptors is integrated to globally regulate limb and joint apparent impedance. And it's speculated that the inhibitory pathways in particular are involved in modulation of limb impedance. We know that the spindle pathways are modulated to some extent during the step cycle, but there may be a much more of an extensive task dependent modulation of the, of the uh, tendon organ pathways to tune the mechanical properties of the limb for specific motor tasks. Okay, implications for the lambda model. Um, I'm probably gonna get myself into trouble here, but anyway, here goes. So mm -hmm. lambda is determined by descending inputs, pattern generators, as well as many sensory inputs, including 1A, 1B, and group two inputs. So lambda representing the threshold for activation of a motor neuron, this is the parametric control of movement, which I think has got to be the way it works. Uh, that threshold is going to be uh, is going to be determined by the convergence of many different inputs, both locally and by remote through the central motor system. The control of the lambda of any given uh, set of motor neurons is carried out by a distributed proprioceptive network in the spinal cord. Indirect supraspinal inputs, such as the vestibulospinal pathways, may control the patterns, parameters for a muscle system rather than single muscles. So I'm arguing for when you get to the level of the musculature, you, uh, you go away from a purely uh, from a modular 
uh, type organization to a parallel distributed one. And the, uh, the determination of the threshold of activation of motor neurons then becomes um, um, part and parcel of that distributed network. Um, ongoing studies in the laboratory um, is uh, number one, verification that eccentric training can restore flexible control of distributed force feedback. This is uh, the physiological part is being driven by Shay McMurtry and, uh, and, uh, my, and also one of my other students, uh, Adam DeBeuf. Uh, and then the Louisville part, of course, is being driven by Dina Howland and her two postdoctoral fellows, Lynette Montgomery and Ray Russell. Second of all, we are developing a minimally invasive method for mapping force feedback during natural behavior. Uh, the problem with the way we've the way we've been doing it is very quantitative and more quantitative than what I'm going to propose, but it is unfortunately requires a terminal experiment, which of course is inappropriate in many cases and doesn't allow longitudinal studies if one is trying to look at the effects of training and so forth. So this is uh, a project that's being spearheaded by Adam DeBeuf with help from Mark Lyle and also Shay McMurtry. And um, it involves using the technique developed by Carol Pratt in the 1990s to use intramuscular stimulation and EMG recording to try to map the distribution of force feedback pathways. We have an initial publication about this. And actually, there's a, a series of papers from Monica Perez and Stuart uh, Baker that have actually looked at this as well using H reflexes. So this seems like a promising new approach to finally being able to see what Golgi tenon organs are doing during natural behaviors and not just limit ourselves to the um, muscle spindle. And then finally, uh, another a mechanical engineering graduate student of mine, Thendral Govindaraj, is actually using a, uh, a computer simulation to test the idea that whether interjoint inhibitory force feedback is capable of regulating intersegmental dynamics using a very stripped down simplified model of the hind limb. And this is being carried out jointly uh, between myself and Greg Sawicki in the School of Mechanical Engineering at Georgia Tech. All right, so here's the promised um, uh, human, um, human experiment. So this was comes out of the laboratories of uh, Paul Gribble and Andrew Przinsky and their postdoc uh, Weiler, um, where they had a human subject uh, who was uh, uh, positioned a forearm uh, over a target, so over a target at, at the hand, and they were using a kinarm device where they could apply um, perturbations independently to the wrist and the elbow, and their primary uh, perturbation was to flex the, forcibly flex the elbow joint through a, a torque motor. And so there'd be a flexion movement. But at the same time as they flex the elbow, they either flex the wrist, left the wrist straight, or extended the wrist. And what they found out is that the response, the reflexive response of the triceps muscles crossing the elbow joint shown their magnitudes are shown over here, were actually variable depending on what had actually happened to the wrist joint. And it, it turns out that in the case when, um, when, the, um, when the wrist was flexed, in addition to the elbow flexion, the subjects then had to return to the target, that the the effect on the on the elbow, elbow joint was minimal, but its reflex, the strength was actually the largest when its mo motion was the smallest. So in other words, the, the reflex response of the elbow joint was being tuned by what was going on at the wrist, wrist and was not, was not um, subject only to what had happened to the elbow joint. And so uh, they looked at the latency of these uh, responses of the of the elbow of the triceps muscles and found that they were within the latencies that are consistent with spinal reflexes. And so they came to the conclusion that in fact, the, uh, the, the, the control of intersegmental dynamics, there actually is a spinal component to this. Now, 
they had no idea which pathways were involved. We do know that there are linkages between wrist muscles and elbow muscles and shoulder muscles in the human, as well as the forelimb of the cat, as I noted before. So there certainly is a potential anatomical substrate for this. They were proposing a presynaptic inhibitory mechanism, which of course may be, may be the case. We don't really know. But the point of, the, the point of this is, is that the, the, uh, the sensory pathways which link muscles across joints and across axes of rotation may be involved in tuning the global mechanical properties of the limb and somehow managing intersegmental dynamics to make the movements come across. And actually, I have to say that these think this, this, these, the thinking about the uh, role of these pathways in intersegmental dynamics were highly influenced by the classic work of Robert Sainberg um, with uh, his experiments uh, with Claude Gez and, and, and others on uh, diaphragmatic patients that really got, got the juices flowing. And he wrote a, he and Gez wrote a really nice article in 1999 where they talked about the various possible um, uh, mechanisms of um, uh, regulating intersegmental dynamics and included equilibrium control, included uh, possibly rapid uh, feedback as well as uh, longer latency feedback and, uh, excuse me, predictive, predictive control from the central nervous system. So anyway, hopefully at some point there'll be a sort of a meeting of, uh, of, of, of worlds here between the cat spinal cord and the human to try to sort all of this out. So I think it's 1.33, so I need to quit. Um, here are my acknowledgments. This work has been supported over the years by uh, two very long-standing grants and two more recent grants having to do with the Spinal Cord in Injury Project. And with that, I will quit and uh, take questions. Okay, Richard. Thank you very much. Well, you maybe can stop sharing the screen so we can see each other. And then others can also turn on your cameras at least, but microphones maybe one at a time. Uh, so uh, I will ask you a question, I'll start, and then everybody else will continue, I assume. So you mentioned that this circuitry in the spinal cord uh, was quite compatible, in your opinion, with the idea of control with reference coordinates. And uh, I wonder, uh, that's of course very dear to my heart and maybe to Anatole's heart, and maybe to a few other hearts in the audience. But um, I, I wonder, I think that when we talk about control with reference coordinates, we always define reference coordinates at different levels of analysis. So for muscles, it is lambdas. For joints, this is okay, reciprocal command and co-activation command. For the whole limb, well, something like that, but uh, in three-dimensional space. Uh, so, uh, so when we start to, uh, considering any kind of task starting from top in the top-down direction, so somewhere on the top you define these commands in a relatively low dimensional space of those reference coordinates for the important things like the endpoint of the limb or even the whole body. But then you have to uh, map them onto commands at the joint level and muscle level. So I just wonder how much of uh, I, I was talking about the same thing, but with different words. How much of your uh, interpretation about limb impedance, for example, control, is actually uh, the way of mapping reference coordinates at the limb level, at the control of the whole limb, to reference coordinates at the level of individual joints and individual muscles, but in such a way that this mapping is flexible, so individual muscles are allowed to wobble and individual joints are allowed to wobble, as long as the end point follows, uh, well, the, its uh, task according uh, to the set parameters, which are reference coordinates. That would, in I think, be uh, somewhat imprecise as controlling the impedance of the system because setting reference coordinates will define how the limb will react to external perturbations. And so if that's the impedance part. So would you agree that this is somewhat similar but with different words or am I missing something? Uh, 
No, I, I, I think I think it certainly is. Um, I, I think that uh, what I'm what I'm arguing is that we have to move away from a, a simple modular view of, of the of, of the way the musculoskeletal system uh, works because the musculoskeletal system has viscoelastic and inertial couple. Anyway, I made that point. Um, you know, it's in, in terms of the human and maybe the raccoon and the rat. <laughs> there are corticospinal pathways that are direct to motor neurons. So there certainly are cases where um, lambda could be directly uh, directly mod modulated or, or controlled by cortical sources. But there are also more indirect pathways such as the uh, vestibular spinal condition, uh, uh, vestibular spinal system, as well as the central pattern generators themselves that seem to um, project not directly to motor neurons, but they, they kind of go into this gamish of, uh, of interneurons inter in the spinal cord and somehow interact with, um, with this distributed proprioceptive network. So when it comes to um, actually producing a, um, a pattern of muscular activity, we were actually talking about this in Journal Club this morning, there, there probably are, there are descending pathways on CPGs that are, that are giving you the, um, um, the actual instructions that muscles are to follow. To, this muscle should contract at this time and all of that stuff. But then there's this proprioceptive network that is uh, tuning the muscle activation, changing its um, wave shape and its magnitude in order to do things to uh, to handle, um, um, you know, intersegmental dynamics, for example, and, and to tune the impedance of the, of the joint. So in that sense, it's hard to uh, to separate to separate out. Uh, you know, at the limb level, I mean, at the muscle level, there's, you can, you can talk about lambda for a given motor neuron pool, but that lambda is being determined not only by private feedback, but also by feedback from all of these other sources. So it seems to me that it diverges maybe slightly from, from the, from Anatole's classical view. Maybe you can um, educate me on that. But you, as you move back back from the periphery, then the system becomes more and more. Uh, it, it it is it's, well. It starts out as being more, more a more distributed system and, and non modular. So I'm not sure that I'm actually answering answering your question. But I think that well, in a way, uh, it's with some uh, digressions and certain things that I'm not. Uh, I would not hundred percent agree with the selection of words, but I think that. In this period, I would agree with what you just said, but I think we have Anatole asking, uh, raising. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping uh, for something from Anatole. Anatole, please unmute yourself before you start speaking. Okay. Uh, from a very, uh, very nice, uh, first of all, I, I would like to, uh, to say, and I enjoy your talk. Um, uh, from a very beginning, you emphasize um, the significant significance of non-linearity of uh, torque angle or invariant characteristic. Uh, so stiffness is not constant along this characteristic. So I, maybe it's not correct to say that uh, the reflexes um, uh, uh, regulate or maintain stiffness. I, uh, I would correct it uh, by saying that uh, all reflexes maintain uh, the shape, uh, removing the hysteresis of this, or minimizing the hysteresis of this characteristic. But there is no function to maintain uh, yes. the same stiffness. Um, so um, yeah. I think uh, uh, there is some inconsistencies uh, between the hypothesis of, of uh, stabilizing stiffness and maintaining nonlinearity of characteristic as you uh, the importance of which you um, 
emphasize. Yes, thank you very much. I agree 100 um, percent. You know, the engineering language we use is, is never is not always appropriate for biological systems. And when you talk about regulation, um, I think I was using the term in the sense that it it causes the muscle to conform to certain uh, mechanical rules. So, um, in other words, there are some nonlinear features that are um, that are regulated out, so to speak, or compensated, and there are other nonlinear features that are actually introduced by the presence of the reflex pathway. So um, I, I agree with you. Uh, it would be more proper to say I would I, I like the idea of or like the use of the term uh, to preserve the shape of the force length relationship and therefore the torque angle relationship. I agree that that's a much more accurate way of saying what's going on. Because without that nonlinear shape, uh, co-contraction would really have not very much use. Okay. I, I have uh, actually... Oh, okay. Sorry, Monica, sorry. Anatole, one more comment and then Monica. I, 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 I will uh, talk about my comment uh, after Monica, okay? Oh no, Anatole, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I actually have such a suggestion uh, for, uh, for Richard to, to do some ex experiment. Uh oh, I'm okay. going to retire soon, man. What? <laughs> uh, um, maybe uh, okay. It's a, it's a, it's very good to let me, um, discuss uh, uh, all uh, afferent feedback in terms of control of muscle, force, length. Uh, but uh, um, can be. Uh, but uh, there is a perhaps for I can suggest a more fundamental function for tendon organs uh, rather than local um, involvement in uh, uh, regulation of uh, of force and length and even uh, regulation of shape of, of characteristics uh, talking um, uh, take a uh, say uh, say uh, I move my I don't know I move my hand uh, to say a cup, okay, um, okay. Um, Let me get out of your way. Uh, it's okay. Okay, I'm there. Yeah, right. but say I, I I would like to uh, grab the handle of the cup, but where is the gravity? Uh, my arm has weight, and so the more I move, far. Assume I assume I directly uh, uh, specify uh, uh, reference trajectory uh, uh, bringing me to uh, the handle of the car. But because of gravity, uh, and especially if I've, I have increased the weight of the arm, uh, this would brought me below the handle. Okay, so my suggestion is that globally, I'm not thinking about uh, moving straight. I just move to straight to the handle. So there is some automatic mechanism uh, which elevate the reference trajectory in such a way that under the influence of gravity, it lowers down and bring me exactly to the handle of the cup. Of the cup. Okay, so I think uh, maybe facilitatory uh, uh, feedback from one B uh, afferent uh, uh, involved in this function of elevation of reference trajectory when we have uh, manipulate. Uh, our body in gra gravity field. Uh, so, uh, experiment. I will ex experiment. Uh, I would um, suggest experiment uh, testing this hypothesis. Say in cat to run the cat to reach a 
uh, some uh, food uh, and um, uh, if uh, natural weight of uh, of the uh, of the uh, uh, upper limb and uh, uh, um, make it heavy so and to see the uh, uh, what is the function of one b uh, uh, Afferent. So, uh, I think it's with, globally, maybe prediction is that it will be facilitatory for all uh, um, the neurons of, of the limb. Uh, so, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's um, technically possible uh, to do this experiment, of course, uh, to teach the cat uh, to reach a food and, uh, and then compare. You have the, all the tools to uh, to to, uh, to do this. Uh, I, unfortunately, I uh, became too old uh, to do such experiments uh, on cats. Uh, okay, I, I'm getting there too, Anatole. But uh, so one very critical thing that you you mentioned twice that you are expecting that it's facilitatory, uh, of course, feedback that may be serving this function, which is a very interesting idea. And we know very little about how facilitatory and inhibitory force feedback are modulated. But with our new method of uh, mapping force feedback, it's going to tell us both force and light, uh, uh, both excitatory and inhibitory feedback. So we might actually be able to test that hypothesis. Yes, it would be. I, I actually uh, uh, like your general idea. But in some way, uh, all the connections, uh, uh, um, uh, anatomical connection, uh, neurons and distribution across the body correspond uh, in some way consistent with biomechanic of, of, the, yes, of the body. Yes. That's a very important idea. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and you nicely uh, uh, elaborate on this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Monica? Okay, so, Monica, uh, it's your turn. Okay, so, Richard, very, very nice presentation. I was wondering about the spinal cord injury. When you do the spinal hemisection, how soon after the injury do you start seeing that direction specificity? Because you show that it was stronger uh, in the gastroc. Uh, you know, when you go from one side to the other. So that's that's very interesting. Uh, how soon after the injury, and can you elaborate a little bit more? Sure. Yeah, sorry. I, I'd go through that fairly quickly. Um, we have done a variety of time points uh, from an acute injury, which means we do the injury during the terminal experiment, two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, and 20 weeks. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is, that from a qualitative point of view, the results were the same at all of those time points. Mm -hmm. So in other words, this was not a matter of some kind of developing plasticity as you find in stroke, for example. This is essentially a really, uh, a, uh, the, spinal, the, the spinal machinery for regulating uh, the force feedback system is suddenly been, the, the descending input has been withdrawn, at least half of it's been withdrawn. Now, the um, results of Chris Tuttle suggest that um, the vestibulospinal tract and, and po possibly the reticulospinal pathways from the brainstem may be key areas which are regulating the strength and distribution of force feedback in the spinal cord. And so we have a, a whole other project funded by the NIH to uh, actually specifically um, lesion those those pathways to, to test that but the interesting thing was that this is essentially a uh, um well i guess the opposite of a release phenomenon it's um these changes were uh, were uh, resulting almost immediately even in, in, in the hmm. acute state hmm. um there are other pathways of course that get released during spinal cord injury as well and one of them is class knife inhibition which uh, results primarily from the uh, dorsal pathways, possibly the dorsal, dorsal lateral reticulous spinal pathway. Um, we're beginning to look at that too and to see how 
these two pathways may be regulated either together or separately. But anyway, uh, the, the main answer to your question is that it's 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 an acute uh, it's an acute response, and there's not a lot of uh, adaptation that goes on. The twenty week cat seem to show basically the same uh, ace, uh, uh, strong biases and in, in forced feedback as the two as the two week cat. Um, the training seems to uh, start to relieve some of the the um, the magnitude of that uh, feedback. Uh, uh, the highly biased feedback and to provide more more of a, a variety of, of combinations as I was saying before so um, anyway that's a long answer to a short question okay so Bob Sandberg and then maybe we will Bob it's yours and then maybe we will switch to written uh, questions from the audience because there are a few Okay. Uh, thanks, Richard. That was a great uh, talk. Um, uh, first, I, I just want to make a comment that the uh, Brzezinski article, um, it, uh, I'm, I'm just kind of wondering whether I didn't read that article. I'm, I'm aware of the line of work, but the wrist extensors and flexors do cross the elbow. So there's a potential for mechanical um, effects that are not uh, mediated by reflexes per se, you know, in terms of modulating the reflex responses. I'm wondering if they're controlled for that, but I'm not asking you that. Oh, look. Um, uh, <laughs> it's a good point. What I'd like to ask you is, you know, the, the issue of modulating limb compliance um, and like kind of cool mechanism uh, uh, that you elaborated um, with vestibular modulation proximal to distal for, for instance, downhill walking. I know you're dealing, your, your experiments are, there, there's a, there's a uh, you're limited in terms of the fine tuning of the compliance um, effects that you're getting, but I'm thinking of a cat in the wild, uh, specifically hanging out in a tree and running, let's say downhill on a branch after a bird, maybe looking up at the bird. Um, what you'd want is specificity of that modulation in different planes, so, for instance, you wouldn't want in that case to decrease your lateral compliance. And I'm wondering if there's any evidence that you have that, you know, you have a, that kind of fine tuning of compliance at the joints, of modulation of compliance. Thank you for bringing that up. That's uh, one of the really exciting things about Ginger's work <clears throat> that I didn't uh, elaborate on. And I, I, I tell me if this is not getting to the point, but this actually goes back to, uh, to Magnus's old experiments. They, what they showed was that the, the integration of uh, neck afferent and vestibular feedback uh, gives you essentially a body orientation signal, the orientation of the body of the animal. These are quadrupeds now. But Ginger also showed that this applies to humans to some extent as well. But um, So the neat thing is that if you stand in one, if a cat stands in one position and moves her head up and down, the signals from the neck afferents and the vestibular system cancel each other out. It's only when the when the animal's body itself there becomes a mismatch between the orientation of the head and the angle of the neck, and then you get something that says that the uh, the uh, the body orientation has changed. Yeah, so, I, I I get that. I seem to remember articles by Roberts on that topic. Also. Yes, yes. Um, but I was actually talking about the peripheral. I that was just an example that I gave. So let's okay. say the cat didn't look up, and okay. was running downhill, but on a branch, so that the compliance of the anterior posterior plane at the ankles um, needed to be decreased, but the compliance in the lateral needed to be increased. Oh, I see. I see. The, the compliance of the lateral and the medial, did you say? The, the, the directional? The directional? Yeah, at, at the ankle. So you don't want to fall off the branch. You want to keep your compliance high in the, you know, lateral components. But, um, I mean, that kind of modulation, Milner uh, demonstrated that you could actually show that kind of differentiation of sure. modulation in humans. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's any indication from the circuits that that kind of distribution could be that well fine-tuned. 
Yeah, well, as you pointed out, this is something that is difficult for me to study under the circumstances that we're studying, uh, you know, with these reduced preparations, but we hope to get to that. But um, I think in that case, the directional, the directional uh, in, uh, compliance, uh, probably it's a, it's a cooperative venture between the force and, uh, the feedback from spindles and tendon organs. So in the cat, for example, the, the ankle is stabilized in the frontal plane by stabilizing muscles that have that are are that that co-contract during stance and they exchange very powerful reciprocal inhibition which of course can be modulated as well so there's every possibility that you could independently um in fact if you tried to squeeze this into the myotatic unit idea you could think of two orthogonal myotatic units of the ankle i suppose if you wanted to go that far but the point is that through manipulation of reciprocal inhibition, uh, uh, maybe positive force feedback, you could actually modulate the um, the impedance of the ankle joint in the frontal plane independently of the impedance of the joint in the sagittal plane. However, that becomes more difficult, and maybe that's sufficient to uh, just constant focus on the distal limbs where you have this more simplified muscular structure. When you get up to the hip and the knee joint, however, now the muscles become multifunctional. And so I think actually CJ might have some thoughts about this because CJ is actually getting into, was getting in, maybe still is getting into that realm of looking at the tuning of inner neurons under different conditions. I think if we could if we could figure out this magic of um, what's going on in the deep dorsal horn, where all of these pathways are converging, it might actually be possible to separate out the uh, the, the regulation of compliance in a, in a plainer way. I, I know I'm not really answering your question by any kind of hard data, but I think that um, you know it, it should be possible to do that. But the way the muscles are activated to do that is going to be a very interesting a very interesting um, uh, uh, organization. But certainly from the distal limb point of view, I think there could be a very straightforward way of doing exactly what you're suggesting. We'll have to wait for CJ because he left us earlier during the talk uh, with excuses, but he's going to speak this coming Saturday and I'm sure that he'll say something uh, rele relevant to that question of Bob. So, Richard, take a look at the chat, please. Uh, Drive, can you see it, I hope? Uh, let's see. Yes, I see it. Um, yeah, and uh, number of questions. Oh, yeah. So, uh, first one is the word stiffness is used as a metaphor. Is that correct? So, uh, I'm not sure that I would call it a metaphor, but I, I think... Um, uh, you and uh, Vladimir uh, made a very good point in that the term stiffness, well, there are two things wrong with the, w the way that I've used stiffness, uh, and I tried to use the word apparent stiffness to try to get around this. Again, engineering terminology is not great. There are two problems with, this, with the word stiffness. One is that theoretically stiffness refers to the static elastic uh, resistance and not to any vis the viscoelasticity introduces a dynamic resistance. The second problem with the word stiffness is that we often use in the field is that let's say the stiffness of a muscle is not dominated by the properties of passive connective tissue except at the extremes. It's actually dominated by the length tension properties of the muscle itself which are are generated by active mechanisms, okay? So in those two senses, the term stiffness is a very poor approximation. So, and the term, uh, the, the, you know, the term apparent stiffness doesn't get around that second objection. So anyway, um, that's my two maybe, cents with it. Yeah, maybe I can add a little bit while you're reading the next question. Uh, we introduced with Vladimir Zatsorsky the term apparent stiffness primarily to get around the problem that elements that behave as if they were springs could be not springs if you look at them more carefully and if you apply different 
mechanical perturbations to them, for example. So stiffness is not a metaphor, and apparent stiffness is not a metaphor. It's kind of partial derivative of force to displacement in a certain direction. But when we say apparent stiffness, we mean that maybe there is no accumulation of potential energy as you expect from a decent spring. Right. So uh, it kind of resists perturbation proportionally uh, to force, uh, well, force proportional to displacement, so looks like a spring locally, but uh, in other aspects, it is not a spring. So it may be a multi-element system with feedbacks and with other things that, if you look with different methods, would not behave like a spring. So that's why if we're not sure that we're dealing with a spring, but we're dealing with a system that behaves like a spring, we decided to call this property apparent stiffness. Right. And those properties actually pass muster at being spring-like, according to the uh, definition of Neville Hogan in his very uh, influential 1985 paper, showing that um, when you look at human subjects, you actually, it behaves as if it has, you can define a potential energy function for the joint. So in that sense, um, you know, it behaves like a nonlinear spring. It maybe looks like a, a nonlinear spring, maybe it, but it isn't a spring. So <laughs> there you go. Um, the next question has to do with, uh, can muscle co-contraction of distal and proximal joints change during training? Uh, in a pointing task, anterior and posterior deltoid co-contraction can start with less and at the end increase. On the contrary, in the same task, triceps and biceps start with higher co-contraction and decrease at the end. Um, I think that's entirely possible, and I, I think the uh, the formalism for dealing with that comes straight out of uh, uh, the referent configuration uh, model, where that um, at the joint level or at the local level, um, you can certainly uh, you could certainly accomplish that in a very straightforward way. Um, how it how it works out in terms of all of these uh, pathways coming back, I don't know. But the fact is that co-contraction is actually a feed-forward mechanism. It's coming out of some descending control. It's not. There's maybe one example from Lacunidi that talks about triggered co-contraction, in which case the co-contraction of the elbow joint uh, around the elbow joint is triggered by. Well, Richard, something happens with, happened with your computer because you're frozen. But while you are frozen, I can add that co-contraction, reflex type co-contraction is sometimes seen in pathological cases and in atypical populations, uh, again, triggered by a perturbation applied to a joint. So it may be of a non-voluntary or, well, involuntary, I don't know, nature. Uh, judging by the latency. Uh, so Richard, all right, we lost Richard. We just hope that he will come back. <clears throat> Meanwhile, is there any contribution of connective tissue to force feedback? Uh, if there is, can be, well, connective tissue doesn't change on the feedback. So I'm not sure, maybe Richard can answer it better, but uh, I assume that connective tissue is passive tissue, so it doesn't get feedback signals. The feedback signals coming to muscles, they are mediated by connective tissue, and in that sense, connective tissue play, uh, does play a role. But uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether there is anything beyond that. I think... I Mark, I, I think the question might be asking whether connective tissue that crosses, uh, you know, two joints so that the stimulus might actually be not, you know, in the experiment, the stimulus is thought to be isolated to one joint. For example, you see an effect at another joint and you make this. Oh, I think that Richard usually takes care of that pretty well in his experiments. So. Uh, their connective tissues are not allowed to uh, meaningfully uh, interfere with the results, I would say. Uh, okay, what is uh, measure force? 
presumably doesn't know anything about definition of force or what is detected precisely. Well, it's detect. Uh, I assume again we're waiting for Richard, but that what's detected is deformation, and local deformation is so basically a change in coordinate of tissues. Uh, and that change in coordinate uh, is proportional to force. If it is in series to the muscle, it's proportional to length. And if it's parallel to the muscle, so in a way, muscle spindle ending and Golgi tendon organ, they are not that different. Uh, they are deformation sensors. And what variable they're proportional to, what uh, their signals are proportional to, is defined way exactly they inserted into the system. So of course, yes, the system doesn't know definition of force, but we do, and we can measure frequency of firing of the ending and show that it is proportional to force. And it kind of makes sense uh, from the location of the sensor. Motor programs in aesthetic sports may be governed in a similar way to rhythmic movements related to the central pattern generator. Oof. Uh, there are several words here, like motor program. I'm not sure what it's meant under motor program there, but let's not waste time on discussions what motor program is. But uh, how much in aesthetic sports is by central pattern generator? Well, probably uh, the locomotion part in aesthetic sports is probably with the participation of central pattern generators, like, I don't know, figure skating or gymnastic, floor exercise in gymnastics, so there must be, but how much, but then it's not aesthetic. I would say uh, what's aesthetic in the aesthetic sports, I think, is not done by central pattern generator. So cat movements are not aesthetic when they're deserberate. Uh, and so I think in humans, probably the aesthetic part is um, not from there. And I disagree. I think the cerebrate cats are the prettiest cats I've ever seen. Uh, okay. All right. Agree with that. Richard, you're back. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it's something I just... I've been trying to answer questions for you meanwhile. <clears throat> and... Uh, but you can, of course, uh, run through them one more time, because maybe you'll say something completely opposite to what I just said. <laughs> uh, would be fun. Okay, so uh, let's see. I've got... Contribution of connective tissues to force feedback. I'm sorry, what about... For sorry, say it again. Number three. Um, somehow I'm not, I'm only seeing one question. Can you read the question for me, please? Okay. Is there any contribution of connective tissue, for example, fascia, to force, force feedback? If there is, can it be quantified? Uh, yeah, so, um, so indirectly, um, the, there are receptors in fascia which don't seem to be serving the same kind of function as uh, force feedback. However, uh, one part of my talk that I deleted for time is that um, many muscles transmit force through fascia. And I had one student who showed uh, that uh, the acceleration of the ankle during stepping uh, becomes much less if you transect the, uh, the curl fascia that links the hamstrings muscles to the ankle. Um, so, if you think about that in terms of force feedback, the tendon organs, the way they are anatomically arranged in the muscle depends on whether they are connected in series with the tendon or the fascia or both. So, it may be that the tendon organs that are in the aponeurosis of origin are detecting the entire force output of the muscle, and the tendon organs that are connected to the tendon are detecting the forces transmitted through the tendon. And then the difference between those is, are the forces that are transmitted through the fascia. So indirectly, I would say, yeah, we have to consider, um, we have to consider the role of, of fascia. Uh, you can influence the, uh, the, the kinematics, the locomotion, I'm assuming the kinetics as well. 
also one finds that if one disrupts the fascia one can sort of lose control of, of the motion it becomes uh sort of out of control so to speak so fascia is something that's really important for us to uh, keep in mind okay. all right next question when it's said that golgi tendon organs measure force presumably it doesn't know anything about f equals ma so what is being detected by golgi tendon organs so I took the liberty of saying that def local deformation is being detected, and it happens to be proportional to force. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, 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 uh, the transduction mechanism of spindles and tenor organs at the molecular level are identical. Yeah, exactly. Okay, good. Uh, do you think that motor programs in aesthetic sports may be governed in a similar way to rhythmic movements related to CPG? Uh, okay, uh, so well, my answer was that CPG does a lot, but not the aesthetic part. Right. Uh, I would agree with that. In addition to that, um, because of the history dependent properties of muscle spindles, the sensory feedback coming back is very, very different in the two cases. So a very slow movement with frequent interruptions is going to be, uh, detected very differently from uh, during a rhythmic movement where, in, in effect, uh, the spindle becomes a linear um, uh, transducer of length. Okay, next one. Are the mechanisms related to the eccentric muscle regime working in the same way, no matter if the movement is performed in a gravity field or in a pure inertial reference frame? Exactly. Uh, I don't think the system would uh, be able to distinguish those two, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would completely agree that uh, researchers separate forces into interaction torque, gravity, inertial, and so forth, while in the body, they're just forces that move things and deform things. Uh, yeah. No matter what the origin is, yeah. I agree, as you say, the tenor organ, the spindle, uh, measure uh, deformation of a membrane. Yeah. Or, okay. Okay. What are the implications of this non-modular behavior of the spinal cord on ascending pathways? Is it, is it suggested that these circuits can self-select ascending information? Um, that's a fantastic question. Um, first of all, we do know that there is ascending information that bypasses those circuits. And in fact, uh, from recent studies of Lee Miller at Northwestern University, recording from, so that the pathways from those receptors uh, ascend uh, without, a, without a, a, a synapse in the dorsal columns to the, the top of the dorsal columns to the dorsal column nuclei, the cuneate and grassal nuclei, and their signaling characteristics, there's no interaction there. Their signaling characteristics are preserved pretty much. And then they go on to the thalamus and the cortex and so forth. So there are examples where the information bypasses the circuitry that I was talking about today. There are also um, um, ascending uh, pathways to the cerebellum through the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract which, interestingly enough, um, uh, the uh, um, studies by Papali and Bosco showed that the, some of these, uh, these uh, interneurons actually code for global characteristics of the limb, such as limb length and not just muscle stretch or joint angle change. Now, that may actually have a simple mechanical uh, um, explanation because of the fact that muscles cross more than one joint. Some of them are triarticular and so forth, so they may come straight out of the anatomy. But it may be that there's a beginning of some kind of uh, integration there at the level of uh, Clark's column. Uh, so I think it's a combination of the two, but I, I think the, the, uh, the deep dorsal horn is more involved in uh, CPG regulation, these local reflexes, than what's actually going upstairs, uh, just a guess. Okay, and one more question, I think it's the final one, uh, after a few good words about your talk. 
Are there papers about clinical exercises for these different receptors? <laughs> Can you exercise receptors? Yeah, well, there there are um, there are there are exercises that involve stretching and uh, and patterns of contraction that that actually take advantage of the history dependent properties of spindles. Now you can't completely decouple those from you know the tendon organs are going to be involved in there in some way too. But the the um, the the way you do these exercises actually. Um, so to bring out those history dependent properties of spindles. So yes, to some extent you could uh, you could take it could take advantage of some of their specialized properties. And I can refer there's some very old papers from Bob Hutton and Earl Eldred and uh, so forth that, that that went through this. And and I I don't have them at the tip of my fingertips, but I can certainly send those on if somebody would write to me. I will be happy to uh, send those references. Great. So, Richard, uh, thank you very much. We give you a round of applause. Oh, I forgot even to prepare a drink. We are supposed to drink to the speaker, but I somehow, gosh, I, I'll bring uh, in a minute uh, a shot glass with something nice. Uh, meanwhile, everybody else, you say good words to Richard. So uh, my our, our younger son actually had his first drink of vodka in, in Mark's house. Yeah. <laughs> maybe 10 or 11 years old, we stopped. We were visiting my mother in New Hampshire and drove back through Penn State, uh, back to Atlanta, and stopped at his house uh, for uh, just a brief visit. And, and we had dinner with uh, with Mark and his family. And, uh, and Gareth received a child's portion of vodka for the first yeah. time. Fantastic. <clears throat> um, Richard, great presentation. I enjoyed it and it was really um, very nicely put together and, uh, you know, uh, educational in a sense as okay. well. I, I enjoyed that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, did you have a, just, did you have another question? Anatole, I think, wanted to ask you. Uh, no, no? Oh, he I just, okay. just comment, uh, just, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the so I'm back with my shot of cachaça. Okay. okay. We were just asking, Anato was asking a no, question. No, I just, uh, uh, my request, uh, don't use uh, the word um, impedance because it's for linear system. Yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's uh, cut my ears. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank right, you also, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant uh, talk. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Good beginning for the second session. Yes. yes. Let me let me just say that uh, Zia Hassan uh, uh, criticized me for the same for also for the use of impedance because it's uh, applied to linear systems. So, if if uh, you physicists out there could help advise me on some improved terminology, I will adopt it instantaneously. So maybe uh, after a few of these, you know, a few. Uh, Drinks, you could come up with some suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cheers. All right. Thanks, folks. See you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. By the way, I love the painting on the wall behind you. It's very me. I love it. Yeah, it's also a guy named Gordon. He's very, very interesting. And he has little pictures of very famous paintings in there. Um, you still continue playing flute? Uh, very much so, yes. Great. In fact, I've got uh, lots of flutes and lots of different sounds. It's my uh, med my form of meditation. Fantastic. All right. Yeah. Goodbye, everybody. Very nice seeing Thanks. you all. Bye-bye. See you on bye. Saturday. Bye. Thank you see you on Saturday. To see Jay. Okay, okay, good. Bye-bye. Adios. Bye. Thank, you. Thank you. Richard, Richard I'm going to send you questions. the questions. So could, so you, could you write, write something? something? Sure. Uh, okay. okay. I'd be happy to. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye -bye. Have, Have a nice week. week. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So, thank, so you thank you, everyone. We have, we have finished the first, the first presentation of the second round of the, of the virtual remote control stability school. school. We have, we have uh, the, uh, the next, next presentation is going to be this Saturday. This Saturday. And, I and I hope all of you stay, stay safe. safe. And see and you Saturday. Saturday.
And, uh, and um, please, please, some of some you, of you uh, uh, have, have subscribed to the, to the Google form, form but somehow, somehow the, the, your email, email is not correct. Not so so I'm receiving some messages, messages back. back. If, if you are, you are one, of one of them, so please, so please do, again do again your subscription because, because there is something wrong, wrong in your email. email. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye bye. Have a nice week. Have a, Have a safe. Stay safe. Stay safe. And, and thank, you, thank for you for all. Leaving the meeting and shutting down the broadcast streaming.